Now, Venezuela in the 1960s and 70s was a wealthy and prosperous democracy. And while it still holds the world's largest oil reserves, the country is now mired in an economic and political crisis. My guest today is one of the millions of Venezuelans who've left their home country. Fabiola Ferrero is a photographer and journalist. Thanks to a recent grant from the Carmignac Foundation here in Paris, she went back to explore the disappearance of Venezuela's middle class. Her resulting project mixes photos with video and archival images. It's titled The Well It's Run Dry. She describes it as a search for the country that existed before the collapse. And we're excited to welcome uh, Fabiola Ferrero here with us in the studio. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you uh, for can coming. you just start by telling us uh, where the idea for this project came from? Um, I think it's a, it's a personal exploration that really started years ago. I've been covering Venezuela as a photojournalist for six years. And this particular project was about six months of work. Um, and it comes from my own search of my childhood memories, but not my own really. Like trying to search for that country that I was, that, that my parents and people around me was telling me about that existed. So I, ca I went back to Venezuela and basically talked to people from different gener generations that could tell me what their memories are of, of the country. And also visiting these places that were symbols of the prosperity during the 80s and 70s and 90s and, uh, and how they look like nowadays. Now you were a photojournalist and you described this project as a sort of investigation. Uh, what did you find? What happened to Venezuela? Uh, wh what happened to Venezuela is a very l long question. So, um, but this investigation uh, focuses mainly on, yeah, on the search for a, a lost promise of this uh, idea of the country of everything uh, is possible because of oil. And it was an investigation that happened in five different cities in the country with five different journalists. And each of them from their own hometowns talks a little bit about, from their um, perspective, about um, what we lost in the past seven years of crisis. It's seven consecutive years of a kind of economic crisis. And what I saw is that it's a lot deeper that we can see um, usually in the media. You know, if, if you, it, it's everywhere. It's in the daily challenges, it's in the infrastructure, it's in the destruction of the universities. Um, it's really everywhere. And I think it's going to be a crisis that it's going to last for a very long time. I want to take a closer look at one of your photos. Uh, it shows a man and a goat. I don't know if we can pull it up somehow in the studio, but I'm sure you know which one I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, can you tell us more about it and more about this man there? It is. These houses are actually, they used to be neighborhoods specifically built for oil workers. And still today, they're legally, some of the houses are still legally owned by PDVSA, which is the, the state oil company. This is particular, this is called Campo Alegria, which translates into Camp uh, Joy. Um, and these were houses that were actually built a lot like American houses, because it was like the American oil companies that brought this for their American workers. Nowadays, this is how many of the houses, houses look like. The, mo most of them are either falling apart or abandoned because people left the country and left the house there. And this person is uh, Geobaldo. And he was, uh, he was an oil worker. He was fired during a big strike that happened 20 years ago, um, where 18,000 people were fired by the then president, Hugo Chavez, for participating in the strike. So basically, the, the whole oil company lost thousands of people, and, uh, but he kept the house. And nowadays, after leaving this oil prosperity, he actually has the goats and, the, and, the, and has some cows as well, to exchange their milk for other food products. And that's how he's actually surviving nowadays. Has he managed to bring any joy back to what was once called Camp Joy? Well, he, <laughs> so the, actually the cows run around the whole camp and between the houses all the time. So some people find it funny, some people find it like, you know, they don't really like it. But beyond that, this really to me talks about life happening as a form of resistance towards the destruction around them. Like even in this context, trying to find a way to keep living and to survive uh, in, in the midst of all the, the chaos and the destruction. So that to me talks a lot about the dignity of the people that are still living in Venezuela. 
And I know you said it's complicated to explain everything that's happened to Venezuela, but how do people there explain what happened to them? Do they, is there a sense of blame? Are there people that they feel are responsible? I think there's a, there's a mix of emotions, but also it's a, you can't really oversimplify the crisis. You cannot really put the blame on one factor or one specific person. Um, there are obviously some big names in the in the recent history uh, that have a lot of, um, of responsibility, but also there's a lot of factors between you know how Venezuela was, the how weak the democracy was or the institutions were, um, and all of that plays a part in the de decay, if you can call it like that, or the economic collapse that happened in the past two, uh, seven years. And also, obviously, we have a big factor, which was the drop of oil prices in 2014, when we have an economy that depends 95% on oil. Um, so that all plays a part. Yeah. Now that the world is facing an energy crisis, there has been talk of the U.S. maybe making a deal to ease sanctions so they can export oil in exchange for Maduro, uh, resuming talks with the opposition. Uh, do you think that that gives, does that give you any hope that, that things could improve soon? Well, the people in actually this picture that you're showing, that's a part of the oil structures in Lake Maracaibo, which is like the center of uh, the oil structure in the country. And the people around it, the last time I, I went, um, they were very hopeful of this, but at the same time, very cautious. Uh, I think Venezuelans have learned as a survival mode to be cautious about hope in general, because they have felt in the past that things are going to get better and then they don't. So what they hope is that the, they're going to actually invest money in the oil um, structures that are many of them look like this to bring back the, the production because it's very, it's been low and we were at a, the highest point, it was like 3 million barrels a day. And now it's about, I think, 300,000. Um, that was the lowest in the past few years. Um, but the amount of investment is considerable. So they're like, you know, we, we would have to see how long it takes to really recover. Because also there is this general sense of recovery, but the country really hit rock bottom. So the recovery, it's still a low. So it's... Complicated. <laughs> and we are running out of time, uh, Fabulous. So I want to ask you uh, if you have any next projects coming up. What's next for you? Are you going to continue to focus on Venezuela or are there other things? Uh, yeah, I think I, I, I'll be working in Venezuela for sure. I, I'm, I don't live in Venezuela anymore. I live in Colombia. So I'm focusing on covering Colombia at the moment. Um, but I go back and forth a lot. So I, I'll be working just covering the region. Okay, well, we'll continue to follow your work. Thank you so much for speaking to us here today on France 24. And for any of our viewers who are here in Paris, uh, Fabiola Ferrero's work will be showing at the Refectoire des Cordeliers from today through November 22nd. Uh, some prints will also be on display in the metro station Solferino. And to learn more about her work, you can always go to the website of the Carmignac Foundation or find her on social media.